this is a great opportunity for uh, this project team to, to present um, on this topic when Jim made the invitation um, to be part of the Lunch Break Science series a few weeks ago. Um, at the time, we thought this topic would be top timely, um, but it's only become more so uh, with each passing week, you know, as we deal with the, the very um, dangerous reality of, of COVID-19 in America. Um, this project um, is an, is a historical study um, of public health policy during the 1918 influenza epidemic, <clears throat> but from the very beginning, it's been conceived um, as something that's very much in dialogue with what's happening right now in 2020. Um, and so we framed this presentation, you know, very much with those comparisons in mind, and we'll have sections all the way through the presentation where we talk about this um, and some more directly at the end. Um, I want to say a special thanks to Ariel Ludwig and Jessica Brabble, um, who have been uh, collaborators in this project almost from the very beginning. I don't think they knew much about uh, the 1918 influenza when they began, um, but we've learned an awful lot. Um, the project website that's listed at the bottom of this screen, and I'll have it up at the end also, <clears throat> does have more information about the project, um, but it also tells you some more about um, work that's ongoing. And so I would encourage you, if you're interested in this, to keep checking back. Okay, I wanted to start with this photograph um, that appeared um, in October of 1918 in, in a number of newspapers across the United States. Um, and it's a photograph of um, uh, the First Lady of Virginia, uh, Mrs. Westmoreland Davis, um, or Marguerite Inman. Um, and the caption for this photograph describes what's happening. Um, it shows her um, volunteering um, at the bedside of influenza patients <clears throat> at the John Marshall High School Emergency Hospital that was set up in 1918 um, to deal with the the crisis of the influenza epidemic. Um, and the last line of this caption says, uh, she is wearing a mask <clears throat> to protect herself from the disease germs. And so this photograph um, actually captures many of the kind of themes that we hope to talk about today. Uh, the extraordinary emergency uh, of the influenza epidemic in 1918 that forced people into uh, new and unexpected roles, including the, the First Lady. Um, the use of a mask in a medical setting um, to protect from the, the spread of germs, but also the visibility of the mask. You know, in this photograph and the caption were clearly intended to communicate the message that this was an unusual medical situation. People had to take special measures, um, and one of those was to wear a mask uh, to protect from the spread. Now, it's interesting neither the patients, who are actually the ones who are sick with the disease, um, are wearing the mask. It's, it's, it's um, Mrs. Davis um, who is doing so. This photograph actually comes from an Indiana newspaper, and we found this photograph in a number of newspapers across the United States, although not yet. Um, in any Virginia newspapers, but Virginia did pay attention to this. So about a week earlier, two weeks earlier, uh, the Richmond Times-Dispatch <laughs> ran a story, um, you know, governor's wife nurses patients um, and very much communicates the same message about her serving um, in this emergency hospital, although this article did not have um, a photograph. Now, it's interesting that um, about 50 years ago now, um, a student at Virginia Tech uh, wrote a thesis about Marguerite Inman Davis um, and included this statement that she recalled in an interview uh, that she was happier nursing the sick during the epidemic than at any time during her stay in the governor's mansion. So that tells you a little bit about um, both her experiences as First Lady, but also her commitment um, to serving her, her um, fellow Virginians during, during this crisis. As I mentioned, this is a project um, at Virginia Tech um, <clears throat> that's been um, sponsored by, by a number of different offices. Um, we continue to work on this project and, and we'll be doing so certainly for the rest of the summer and probably into the fall. Um, and it very much responds to current conditions here in 2020 and the kinds of questions um, that we're asking and the kinds of policies that were being implemented in the response of the public um, to mask wearing. And so I encourage you again um, to keep track of what we're doing and, and look at the website. Today, we're going to talk about a couple different things. Um, I'm going to provide a brief timeline for the 1918-19 influenza epidemic so you have some sense of the context. Uh, Ariel will then talk about uh, masks in Virginia, medical uses of masks, and how masks are required for certain occupations. And then, as Jim mentioned, we'll take a quick break um, and address any questions that have come up for the first part of this talk. And then Jessica will talk about um, kind of mask mandates in public spaces, including um, college campuses, 
but also reactions to masks, both by the public and physicians. And then I'll finish up by talking about some of the numbers, um, as well as the lessons that we think can be learned from this experience. And then we'll take again some core questions at the end. Um, briefly, in terms of this timeline, you know, you can divide up the, the, the epidemic into a couple of stages. In the spring and summer of 1918, there was a widespread increase in cases of influenza and respiratory disease. A um, few places in the United States, but much more commonly across Europe as well as parts of Asia. And this is when the name Spanish influenza first appeared in newspapers uh, because there were a lot of cases being reported um, out of Spain and that were being covered in these newspapers. Um, nobody claimed the disease came from Spain itself, but it re was referred to as Spanish influenza. And that was pretty continuous um, for the rest of 1918. Things changed in September of 1918. You get a sudden increase in cases and in some ways, more importantly, in the number of deaths in U.S. Army camps, uh, first on the East Coast, but then elsewhere in the country. Uh, camp Humphreys in Virginia, what's now Fort Belvoir, you know, in just five weeks, they recorded more than 4,000 influenza cases and more than 400 deaths, which is especially striking because these were young men. They had to pass a physical to get into the Army, um, and they were getting sick and dying at an astonishing rate. It then moves into the cities and into the rural areas of the country pretty quickly also. And so if you think about October, November 1918, this is really the, the, the worst part of the epidemic, a very, very high numbers of cases and deaths um, across the United States. In most places, this lasted between four and six weeks. So some places it started as early as late September and was over pretty much by late November. Other places really didn't hit until early November, and then it lasted into November and early December. Um, and this is where you see a number of measures that of course we're familiar with now. Schools, businesses closing, churches closed, all of these efforts to try and contain the epidemic and also mask regulations. By December, it mostly quiets down, and then you start to see another increase um, in cases, but it's less intense than in October, November, and, and fewer deaths. Um, and it lasts at least through February 1919, most places, in some cases, even a little bit later. Some schools were closed, particularly you know, before and after the, the, the holidays, but generally businesses remained open in this period of time. And so even though the epidemic does continue in 1919, it's not nearly the intensity uh, characteristic of the fall. So at this point, I'll turn it over uh, to Ariel to continue the discussion. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Um, so the net, we can start with the next slide. As the epidemic in Virginia began in early September in the military camps, um, Camp Lee, uh, the first initiative to address the epidemic began within the camp itself. The base required that men diagnosed with influenza wear a gauze mask as well um, as was expected from all of the healthcare workers. Uh, events on the base were also canceled as the infirmaries filled. However, the bases were not self-contained and the virus quickly began to spread in the community. Virginia health officials responded with an educational campaign that highlighted the importance of covering one's mouth when coughing and nose when sneezing. However, these educational materials did not recommend mask wearing in public. In early October 1918, the Virginia State Department of Health advised local health departments to ban public events and close theaters and churches, while many other states implemented mask ordinances alongside measures we now refer to as social distancing. Virginia, however, did not. In issuing recommendations, this left decisions about social distancing to localities. By early November, a number of cities, including Richmond, required social distancing. However, by the beginning of December, these were eased. This led to another drastic rise in cases with the dawning of a new year. Although masks were required by many cities in the United States, Virginia cities never officially passed a universal mandated mask law. Masks were, however, recommended across the state and required for many public facing employees. Next slide. The fast rise in flu cases taxed the Virginia medical system greatly, which was worsened by healthcare workers themselves getting the flu. Healthcare workers were required to have and wear gauze masks, whether they were serving in hospitals, converted hospitals, or homes of the sick. In September 1918, the United States Public Health Services 
which coordinated the healthcare services and directed healthcare workers and volunteers to areas of greatest need across the country. Um, they, they set forth professional guidance that healthcare workers wear masks. On October 6th, 1918, the Times Bispa Dispatch from Richmond published the directions and equipment given to nurses in the area that were battling the flu epidemic. Nurses making home visits were provided with a large apron, soap, nail brush, biochlor biochloride of mercury tablets, two gauze masks, and various medicines. They were told to adjust their masks over their nose and mouth and to instruct others in the home of the ill to do the same. Upon leaving the sick room, they were to carefully remove their masks and wash it thoroughly in an antiseptic solution. Those who wore masks in the presence of the sick were instructed to either boil or burn their masks immediately afterwards. Next slide. On October 10th in Newport News, the local exemption board directed its members uh, uh, and employees to wear masks under the recommendation of the Surgeon General of the Army. Clerk of the board, Harry H. Holt, agreed with this, advising offices employing any number of people to wear gauze masks until the epidemic was over. By October 18th, Dr. H. C. Robles, the acting medical officer in charge of the United States Public Health Service, directed all lunchroom waiters and waitresses, soda fountain employees, and barbers to wear masks while working. Given their close proximity to the public, Dr. Robles believed that masks were the best way to prevent both employees and customers from catching the flu. Masks made by the Red Cross were distributed by the local health departments. Next slide. The Lynchburg Department of Health required bank tellers, streetcar employees, barbers, and dentists to wear masks. On October 14th in Lynchburg, John Harris, a streetcar conductor, was arrested for refusing to wear a mask while working. The general public was still not required to wear masks, but many leading physicians and health boards recommended that they be worn in order to slow the spread of the flu. On October 11th, the Richmond Times Dispatch reported that physicians asked that the public wear masks until the flu abated. The Red Cross quickly responded to this request, making thousands of masks for further distribution. Next slide. By this time, droplet infection, which refers to the understanding of germs causing disease, was largely accepted. But this did not mean that the use of masks was universally accepted as an effective method of protection by the medical community. However, there were a number of prominent medical experts who are strong proponents of wearing gauze masks for the broader public beyond healthcare spaces. Just as these experts presented their opinions, others were far more skeptical. In part, the fact that Virginia did not require the public to wear masks may have reflected the controversy that is revealed in the scientific literature. For instance, while the, while the labs demonstrated that masks were effective in reducing droplets from the nose and mouth when speaking, coughing, or sneezing, how well this translated to the broader public was far less clear. This resonates with what we see today with COVID-19. Um, these are, uh, there are a number of parallels between the 1918 flu and COVID-19. Several of these will be covered by Jessica, but I'm gonna be covering um, the making of masks. Sorry, forgot to say next slide. All right, next slide again. Um, so the first thing that I, I'm going to talk about in this comparison is the making of masks. Instructions from the Journal of the American Medical Association were reprinted in Virginia Medical Monthly on October 12th, 1918, telling Virginians to create masks made of three layers of six by eight butter cloth with hemmed edges um, that were, would be tied behind. Uh, as you can see, the final version that is printed on the CDC website pr uh, presently, which is on the left side of this screen, gives instructions for sewing two 10 by six re rectangles of tightly woven fabric with elastic loops or hair bands for ear loops. Both of these DIY instructions re reflect a shortage of manufactured masks 
on the scale needed for the pandemic. While there are differences in materials, there are also some noticeable similarities and resonances. Jessica will be addressing a number of these differences and similarities at the end of the next section. Next slide. Please let me know if there are any questions at this time, and we will also be answering questions at the end of the presentation. Uh, yes, Dr. Lund, we did have a question. Uh, we had a guest ask if it's true that the flu in 1918 in the U.S. broke out on an army post in Kansas. I can address that. Well, um, yes. <laughs> Um, Kansas was one of the, uh, this, this army camp in, in Kansas <clears throat> was one of the first places where they noticed these um, kind of uh, increased number of, of cases of influenza and other forms of respiratory disease. Um, and it was reported internally within the Army Medical Corps at the time, although not necessarily or, or, or only a little bit in the newspapers. Um, but there were also cases reported elsewhere in the world. Um, even before that in, in March of 1918 um, and subsequently. Um, and I think this has been one of the, one of the challenges both for um, historians, but also epidemiologists. You know, with influenza outbreak, there, there's not a patient zero. There's not a single point that you can, you can say, this is where it began and it spread from here. It really has to do with what doctors are, are paying attention to um, and how it gets reported and so on. So, um, but this is another reason to, to you know, um, recognize that this did not begin in Spain because those outbreaks in March of 1918 were well before anyone was referring to it as Spanish influenza. Okay, and we did have another question. Uh, how long did the 1918 influenza last for? How long did the, the pandemic continue? Well, it continues into 1919 in the, in the sense that there are um, certainly an increased number of cases of influenza um, and also an increased number of deaths, um, both from influenza and pneumonia. And I'll talk at the end um, about some of the statistics that show how much that uh, continued into 1919. Um, but in terms of the public health measures, those are really concentrated in, 19, in the fall of 1918. Um, the, the, the longer term into 1919 is, is much more gradual. It's near, not nearly as intense. And so the public health measures are not nearly as drastic as what we see in 1918. And so in some ways, I think when we look at comparisons to what we're going through in 2020, it's really the fall of 1918 that's got, that's, that makes the best, uh, it shows the best, most similarities, but also differences. Okay, and uh, one last question. Uh, when we're talking about a gauze mask, what would be the difference between that and like uh, a modern surgical mask as far as like the tightness of the weave and how effective it would be? Ariel, do you want to answer that? Sure. Um, so there actually were a number of studies at, at the time, um, and they actually recommended a fine weave gauze mask. But obviously, um, the ability to inhibit uh, droplets, um, and, and I think they also found that ultimately the safest, uh, eventually they found after doing numbers of studies of droplets and Petri dishes, um, was that five layers of gauze um, helped and uh, that the radius around which the droplets were falling was primarily, they found in 1918, um, four feet. Um, so these gauze masks uh, certainly were shown to inhibit the droplets, but really can't be compared to the fibers um, that are used today. Now, uh, even for the masks that the CDC presently, the DIY masks, they recommend using a tightly fabric, um, like quilting fabric, um, but they uh, and they say that they can be used by t-shirts, but or you you know like t-shirt material, but that's not maybe the highest recommendation. Um, so yeah, there's obviously a huge amount of materials change over time, and I think that looking at those as technologies is really interesting. Okay, great. Uh, I think we can go ahead and move on and save some more for later. Okay, that sounds good. Uh, Jessica? Thank yes, thank you. Um, so, as Ariel mentioned, masks were used in many public spaces, including the military camps. Many of the first influenza patients were from those military camps, like she said. 
Infected individuals were required to wear masks in an attempt to slow the spread of the flu. Because of this, the demand for masks quickly rose in the camps. On October 4th, the Alexandria Gazette reported that Camp Humphreys, which is today known as Fort Belvoir, was in need of 10,000 masks. Women at the Alexandria chapter of the Red Cross, Cross quickly responded to this and made those masks in just five days. The masks, 10,000 of the masks went to the hospital at Camp Humphreys and an additional 100 masks for a temporary hospital at Christ Episcopal Church. Next slide. Also, as Ariel mentioned, the general public was not required to wear masks, but many physicians recommended it. Richmond physician, Dr. J. Fulmer Bright was one of these doctors. He recommended that both the sick and the healthy wear masks over their noses and their mouths as the best method of preventing the flu. The Red Cross quickly responded to this across Virginia and made thousands of masks. Next slide. Red Cross chapters in cities like Roanoke, Lynchburg, Richmond, and Norfolk all made masks. These masks were made much like the ones Ariel discussed earlier. In Norfolk, the Red Cross provided every city, state, and federal employee with the masks at no charge. In Roanoke, every volunteer nurse was given a mask for free. And in Richmond, the mask could be purchased from the Red Cross for three cents. The demand in Richmond soon became so large that the supply was depleted several times a day. Every time the supply was depleted, orders would be given to the Red Cross chapter to make more. In the lulls where there were no masks available at the Red Cross building, long lines would form around the building while people waited. Boy Scouts were stationed at each door to keep the public informed for how long they would have to wait, and some people waited for up to 30 minutes to purchase a mask. Next slide. So today, 28 states have a statewide mask mandate in place in order to prevent COVID-19. Unlike in 1918, one of these states is Virginia. As you might know, on fr Friday, May 29th, an official mask mandate went into effect requiring Virginians age 10 and older to wear face coverings in public. There are some exceptions to this rule. You don't have to wear a mask while eating or drinking, while exercising, or if your health condition prohibits masks. The mask mandate originally appeared to contradict code 18.2-422. This code was first passed in 1950. It makes it unlawful for anyone to wear a mask with the intent to conceal his identity. One business in Virginia even attempted to challenge the mask mandate and say that the mask mandate conflicted with the code. Attorney General Mark Hearing successfully upheld the mandate because the mask mandate provides a specific prefix for the mask. In a statement, Herring said, quote, wearing a mask is such an easy, effective way to help control the spread of COVID and to show your fellow Virginians that you care about the health and well-being of your friends, neighbors, and community. Next slide. Some colleges in 1918 also made efforts to protect their students from the flu epidemic. When the epidemic first started, Dr. George Lawson was called to visit Hollins College in Roanoke. Within a, when he first visited, he reported that the situation was, quote, very satisfactory. But within a few days of his visit, student Louise Maps actually died from the flu there. In December, as girls at Hollins began to travel home for Christmas, each of them was given a gauze mask to wear during their travels. They were instructed to wear it when they were on their trip home on the trains or in cars. According to the World News, masks, most girls dutifully followed these instructions, but many reported feeling uncomfortable or that the masks were unnecessary. University of Virginia students also reportedly wore masks. Author Virginia Dabney wrote the following in his book, Mr. Jefferson's University. Quote, during the dreadful influenza epidemic in the fall of 1918, all students wore white masks in the hope of avoiding the deadly pestilence. Many fell ill and some died, including Professor William Harry Heck, who was lecturing on how to avoid the flu. Next slide. So much like colleges in 1918, today's colleges and universities are currently struggling with how to best protect students during the COVID-19 epidemic. As I mentioned, Hollins College and the University of Virginia's students and staff wore masks. In Williamsburg, the College of William and Mary was forced to implement a lockdown in late September of 1918 because of a large outbreak of the flu. No students were allowed to leave campus and no one was allowed to come back onto campus. College administrators today are struggling with similar concerns. With, with students returning in less than a month, many have released plans for their fall semester that echo requirements from 1918. For example, students at Hollins University, which was Hollins College in 1918, will be required to wear face coverings indoors and maintain social distancing whenever possible. 
According to William and Mary's fall plan, students will likely have to be tested for COVID-19 when they return to campus. Any students who are symptomatic will be required to isolate in a residence hall set aside specifically for quarantine. The University of Virginia has elements from both of these plans. Students will be required to be tested for COVID-19 upon returning to campus and masks will be mandated for all. In order to help with this, the university is providing face masks to all personnel and students when they return to campus. Next slide. Because there was no mask mandate in Virginia in 1918, there's very little record of the public's reaction to masks. However, elsewhere in the United States, the reaction varied widely. Many citizens were happy to follow mask laws and wore face coverings whenever in public. However, as we found in our research across America for our project, we have found many instances of citizens failing to follow the mask law. In one California city, for example, over 1,000 mask slackers had been arrested by November. In some of these arrests, people simply forgot to put on their mask when they stepped outside or they had their mask underneath their nose. Other people were arrested because they took off their masks for some reason. A lot of these were men who took off their masks so they could smoke. Elsewhere, arrests were made when people outright refused to wear their masks. In one instance in Sacramento, resident Frank Bobich said that he'd rather be killed or hanged than wear a mask in public. In San Francisco, some residents even formed an anti-mask league to protest mask ordinances implemented. Next slide. So reactions like this might sound familiar to us in 2020, where masks have become a hotly debated topic. Protests against mask mandates have cropped up nationwide, with many believing it's unconstitutional or unsafe to wear masks during the COVID-19 epidemic. There are two big differences between 1918 and 2020. First, man mask mandates in 1918 tended to last only a few days or a few weeks. In 2020, as we know, mask mandates can last for a lot longer. Secondly, in 1918, fines and arrests were heavily used during the epidemic to enforce mask laws. In 2020, even though many states have implemented mask mandates, very few have enforced them with arrests or fines. In Charlotte, North Carolina, one man was arrested for refusing to leave a local market after being asked to wear a mask. In Oregon, another man was arrested for leaving a courthouse after refusing to wear a mask. However, in that instance, the judge declared that the man had been arrested for leaving without completing his original hearing, not because he didn't wear a mask. Despite these few instances, there has been very little legal backlash against members of the public who are against masking, making 2020 a much different year than 1918. Next slide. So even though there were lots of recommendations by physicians in 1918 in Virginia to wear masks, some were still skeptical about their benefits and the seriousness of the flu itself. In late September, Dr. Brownlee Foster of Roanoke initially advised people to take a sane view of the outbreak, saying that there was no occasion for panic in Roanoke. As flu infection rates quickly increased, it became clear that something had to be done to stop the spread of the virus. Nonetheless, Dr. Foster was hesitant to close Roanoke meeting places like churches and theaters and hoped that the public would avoid crowds without any kind of mandate. Only once the State Board of Health recommended closing public places like schools, churches, and theaters did Dr. Foster close these places in Roanoke. Later on, when he was asked about his stance on masks, he stated that while masks were important for healthcare workers, most of the members of the public did not wear them properly, which meant that they provided no benefit. After the epidemic had ended, Dr. Edwin Jordan drew similar conclusions. He stated that masks were beneficial for those caring for the sick, but that the public was not protected from the flu by wearing them. Next slide. Although physicians were divided during the 1918 epidemic, there's a relatively united front among physicians in 2020. Dr. Bradley Harper of the Peninsula Health District, which covers cities like Newport News and Williamsburg, urged residents to wear masks in order to prevent COVID-19. In a recent statement, he said, quote, not only does it protect me, but it protects those around me as well. Dr. Norm Oliver, who's Virginia's health commissioner, echoed this statement saying that masks, quote, are very important and about protecting each other. So now I'm going to toss it back to Dr. Ewing to talk about some vital statistics. Thank you, Jessica. Uh, I appreciate that. Um, yeah, so I'll just finish up with a couple more things and then we'll have some, some time for, for questions. Um, I do think it's important to, to look at the numbers um, when we think about comparisons between the 1918 epidemic and what we're going through now in, in 2020. Um, the best estimates for the United States is about 675,000 
um, deaths from influenza, but also from pneumonia, um, which was a, a related cause of death during the epidemic. Um, in Virginia, it, it's about 14,000. Um, and the Virginia rate of death was very similar to the national rate, both by in terms of up per 100,000 of the population. Um, if you compare that to what we're going through now in, in, in with COVID-19, you know, there's some, some striking differences. Um, the total number of deaths that we see now at 137,000 as of this week, you know, is, is truly astonishing and, and um, you know, and very frightening, uh, but it's still a much lower number than what we saw in 1918 with a population that's three times as large. Um, and that ratio is similar also for Virginia with about 2000 deaths um, as of this week, um, you know, out of a population of eight and a half million. Um, so I think this is a one way to, to, to kind of think about comparisons between um, 1918 and 2020. Um, of course, we are, you know, only partway through the COVID-19 epidemic and we don't know what will happen going forward. Whereas with 1918, we have the, the, the benefit of knowing um, what these numbers are in, in terms of their, their final um, outcome. And just <clears throat> to follow up on the question that was asked earlier, um, this chart shows um, the death rates in Virginia from three of the main causes of death, uh, tuberculosis, pneumonia, and influenza um, in 19, from 1913 to 1917, you know, in some ways the normal period before the epidemic. And you see a lot of continuity um, in that period. And influenza is causing, you know, not that many deaths per thousand certainly compared to those other diseases. And this is what changes so, so dramatically in 1918. Um, the death rate goes from, you know, teens, 20s, and 30s up to almost 350 uh, per thousand, and then it goes back down. Um, so you do see how dramatic this spike is. Um, as I mentioned earlier, when I was talking about Camp Humphreys, you know, many of these deaths from influenza 19 are actually from men and women in their 20s and 30s and 40s. This is an age where this is not normally a cause of death. And it's one of the things <clears throat> that truly um, shocks the medical experts, they did not expect this. They don't know what causes it. In some ways, we still don't know what causes it, um, but it's certainly characteristic of this period. Um, as we've worked on this project, you know, we've it's been helpful for us to think about similarities between 1918 and 2020, um, but also important differences. Um, and some of these we've already mentioned as we've gone through this presentation, you know, certainly that both diseases were very sudden and unexpected um, when they started. Um, public health measures were implemented urgently and massively, um, as we've seen in the spring and summer of 2020, but they're done very unevenly. There are different jurisdictions. The timing varies quite a bit. Um, as Jessica mentioned, we see compliance with public health me measures, but also resistance. Um, and as we've learned again and again in 2020, you know, any predictions about what's going to happen are very speculative. They're, they may be based on the best evidence at the time, but we really don't know what's going to happen. Um, at this point, there is no effective prevention, treatment, or cure for COVID-19, as was the case in, in 1918 with influenza. And both are global pandemics, but they have significant national as well as regional differences. But it's also important to think about the differences uh, between the two epidemics. Um, influenza was similar to seasonal flu, and part of the reason that the public health experts were slow to act in 1918 is they thought it was just another flu um, outbreak. Um, and so it took some time to adjust, whereas as we know, COVID-19 is, is unique. COVID-19 can be identified by tests. Um, it's much harder to diagnose influenza. You really have to look at symptoms. And I think an awful lot of people who were sick in 1918, you know, never went to the doctor or never had their symptoms recorded. So they don't show up in the statistics. Um, in that sense, we can be more precise um, in how we count COVID-19 cases. Obviously, the war is going on in 1918. The war ends on November 11th, right in the midst of this epidemic for many parts of the country. Um, and the government had a lot more control over information. There was censorship, there was control. You could still learn a lot about the influenza in 1918 from reading this newspapers, um, but it was a different kind of information system than what we're used to now. Certainly now we know information travels much faster um, than in 1918. We, we have access to much more information, but misinformation spreads quickly also. And that's a reality. It was true in 1918, but I think it's probably even more of an issue for us to deal with now. Um, we see more polarization in how Americans are reacting uh, both to the health crisis, but also to public health measures. Um, and I think we can anticipate that the recommendations and regulations on masks 
are going to last a lot longer in 2020 than what people experienced in 1918. Um, as Jessica mentioned, most mandate, mask mandates in 1918 lasted at most weeks, uh, in some cases days, only in a few cases that they go on for months, whereas, as we know, we've already had at least in Virginia, two months now are requirements and we can anticipate that lasting longer. And that's a significant difference. As we've studied these materials and looked at these projects, you know, we've come back to the conclusion that masks do contribute <clears throat> to public health during an epidemic in several ways. They reduce the potential for transmitting infected droplets that are spread by a sick or infected person. Um, they're most effective in combination with other public health measures, including social distancing, personal hygiene, use of other kinds of protective clothing. Masks contribute to public health by allowing safer operations, businesses, schools, amusement centers, and other activities, especially where social distancing is difficult or impossible. And masks communicate to others that you care about preventing the spread of the disease. Uh, the mask is really about protecting the health of all, not just the person who's wearing the mask. And so these were really our most important lessons that we could think of from the, the historical research we've done and this evidence that we can find from 1918 and thinking about the comparisons with 2020. Uh, we're gonna stop here. Um, I don't know if it's a benefit or not, but certainly one of the consequences of all of the attention to masks in 1918 was mask poetry. Uh, this is just one example, there are others. Um, I can't uh, claim that this is good poetry, but I think it's a good message. Um, if you think you're quite well, wear a mask. Wiser heads than yours can't tell, wear a mask. You would fight for Uncle Sam, uh, then for him, give flu a lamb. If you're worth a tinker's dam, wear a mask. The one lesson you should learn, wear a mask. So I'll stop there, I won't read anymore. Um, but we would welcome questions if you're interested in this project and you'd like to follow up. Again, the website is listed at the bottom there. Um, and will also be posted with the, with the resources that go with this presentation. So thank you very much for your attention and we would welcome your questions. Okay, uh, Dr. Ewing, we've got quite a stack of questions in the queue here, so we'll get to as many as we can. Do uh, you have any statistics about what percentage of Virginians or Americans actually complied with wearing masks in 1918? Any kind of a rough idea? No, <laughs> it's a short answer. Uh, we're trying very hard to figure that out um, <clears throat> because Virginia did not, as far as we can tell, none of the cities in Virginia had a mask requirement. Um, in that sense, we can't make a claim about the number of people who, who did wear masks in public or not. Uh, my sense is that, you know, in the medical settings, the hospitals, um, you know, most people, nurses, physicians, and also family members, you know, did wear masks as long as that was required. So that's the case in Virginia. When we look at other cities, this has been a, a recurring question. We've actually got a couple of articles that are in the process of coming out that exactly address this question. I would make, I guess, three generalizations, and these build on, on the examples that, that Jessica provided. Um, the first was that most people did comply with the orders when they first came out. And we can have a number of newspaper articles <clears throat> where the reporters were out on the streets and they're saying, look, everyone's wearing a mask. And they, you know, describe where people were wearing masks and they praise the public for wearing masks and so on. So that's the first one. The second is, you know, we have records of people being arrested for wearing masks. But those arrests tended to happen in the first few days after these laws were passed. And so they do have a sense in which they are, you know, kind of demonstrations. You know, this, this law has been passed. We need to enforce it. How do we enforce it? We go out and we arrest people. Um, we find them or we tell them to wear a mask and threaten to arrest them the next time. And so we have some numbers on that. Uh, Jessica mentioned a thousand uh, mask slackers in San Francisco. We have evidence from uh, cities in California and in Indiana and in Utah and other places um, where they did have these mask ordinances. But it's really hard to generalize from that. I mean, it'd be like saying, you know, how many people get <clears throat> fined for, you know, not wearing their seatbelts compared to the number of people who actually don't wear seatbelts. It's really hard to, hard to do that. The third conclusion, and this I think is probably most relevant to what we're going through here in 2020, is not so much defiance of mask laws or resistance as it is people forgetting, people in people who are indifferent, who just don't care, um, who or who think wearing a mask is inconvenient and they just stop. Um, you know, and, and we see examples of that from 1918. It's really hard to count people who are doing so. 
you know, but if you think about it, that kind of behavior is every bit as dangerous um, for public health as the people who who are you know being defiant about not wearing masks. Um, and so I think that's you know really where we're kind of focusing in terms of how did you communicate this public health message about the reasons to wear masks, and how did you get people to follow this? Whether this was a recommendation, a regulation for specific occupations, or a requirement for everyone in public. Um, and so that's it's a long answer. It's a it's a lot of generalizations, but. Um, that's the best we're doing in terms of, of you know, trying to trying to track down this information. Okay, uh, so next question. Uh, we talked about news accounts here, but uh, in your research of primary source material, did you look at any private correspondence, uh, like letters or diary entries, to see how maybe families and individuals were reacting to the mask requirements? Uh, let me start by addressing that, and then Jessica Panera, if you have have thoughts, that would be great. Also. Uh, generally, no. You know, we've been focusing on the newspaper reports because, first of all, those are accessible, um, and also they give a really good sense of um, kind of how this these policies develop day by day, uh, week by week. You know, we can use the newspapers to go back, um, you know, and track when the ordinances went into effect, how they were being enforced, and then how they're being debated and ultimately. Uh, rescinded, you know, re and come, they come to an end in various cities. My sense is from the sources I've looked at from diaries and letters, masks do come up, but they are quite anecdotal. You know, someone will say, oh yeah, we saw people wearing a mask or, you know, why are these people wearing a mask? The other problem is often the, the oral histories um, that we have from the 1918 influenza um, were from children at the time. Um, you know, and so what they see of the world is what children see of the world now. They see what their family is doing or people on the streets. They're not necessarily, you know, thinking about these in terms of public health measures or enforcement or other things. Um, so this is certainly something we want to do more of. Um, but you don't see as much attention in letters and diaries and other forms of, of personal narratives about masks that you do with some of the other kind of consequences of the epidemic, you know, whether this is uh, family members getting sick, uh, you know, public funerals, other kinds of restrictions. Jessica, Eric, did you have any any further thoughts on that? Yeah, I'll tack on really quick. Um, so one of the problems with researching an epidemic during an epi epidemic is that the archives are not accessible like they usually would be, and a lot of those personal letters and diaries are in the archives and not digitized yet. Um, but I will say that one thing I think that we still have in researching newspapers is that a lot of people wrote letters to the editors or even in newspaper reports about people being arrested or whatever, their comments were recorded in those. Um, so we do have people's personal feelings and opinions, even though we're pulling those from newspapers rather than personal documents. Good, thank you. Uh, so uh, another question we had, are, are surgical masks more effective or are the cloth masks more effective? Ariel, do you want to handle that one? Sure, I certainly can. Um, I, first, I guess I am not super clear in terms of surgical masks. So if you're talking about respirators um, today, those are obviously uh, going to be more effective. They've been demonstrated to be more effective. Um, and, and those are typically used uh, in medical settings. Um, I think that given the shortage of N95 masks, it's really been a call to the public that um, this is a way to reduce your risk by making the fabric masks. Um, and then also making sure one of the big things um, that is reflected sort of across the literature yeah, both in terms of the 1918 uh, epidemic and now, is that the fit of the mask is also quite uh, quite important. So thinking about um, the personal fit of the mask is vital to actually giving you the additional layers of protection. And this was something that came up <clears throat> in the enforcement um, yeah. in places, you know, that, that you could be find arrested for wearing the mask improperly. Mm -hmm. um, so, so not covering your, completely covering your nose and mouth 
um, as Jessica mentioned, pulling the mask down so you could smoke. Okay. <laughs> Those are examples where, you know, they did understand what the mask was doing. Um, and in addition to the instructions that Ariel mentioned for how to make a mask, there are lots of instructions about how to wear a mask um, and what to do and so on. And so there was that attention, you know, at least in the, in the, in the newspapers and reporting um, the recommendations of, of boards of health. Uh, we've done a little bit of work where we've looked at photographs um, that were taken in, in one case in Stockton, California city, um, where they had a big uh, celebration on November 11th of the end of the war, big, you know, patriotic um, a day, which came in the middle of uh, a mask ordinance. And so one of the instructions that went out um, you know, was to wear a mask when you were out in public. And, and when we look at these photographs, um, most people are wearing masks, in fact, um, but some of them are wearing masks improperly. You know, they're around their neck or uh, below their, their nose and mouth. Um, and some people aren't wearing masks, you know, and so that's one example where we're trying to uh, go beyond just the, the regulations and the, and, the, and the recommendations and actually look for other kinds of evidence of how widely these practices were actually uh, done by people at the time. Okay, and another question, Dr. Ewing. Uh, was there a lot of newspaper censorship during World War I, and how did that affect your analysis? There was certainly censorship. There was, there was pre-censorship um, of articles. Uh, there was self-censorship in the sense that the, the newspaper editors, you know, were very careful in, in what they were writing. In most cases, you know, that censorship related specifically to the war. Um, and so if you look at, you know, articles about uh, th there was lots of newspaper coverage of the of the war itself, um, where the American troops are. Uh, there there are constant lists of men who have died in the war, uh, who are missing, who are wounded. So so the the war is covered, but you know there's there's a lot of censorship there. So example, you'll look at a letter from a soldier, and it won't give you a location. You know it'll say you know somewhere on the front lines or somewhere in France or something like that. So there certainly was censorship um, and there's political censorship as well. In terms of coverage of the influenza epidemic, I don't think censorship was the most important issue. Um, you know, the, the newspapers were very uh, critical of, of public health organizations. Um, they printed the numbers um, of, of cases and deaths at the local level. They printed them nationally. Uh, in December of 1918, there's a, an, an article that appears in many, many um, newspapers across the country that says, you know, influenza death, influenza is more costly than the war. More Americans died from the disease than died, you know, in the in in battle in, in France. Um, so it's not censorship that's shaping how this this disease is covered. I think there were a couple things going on. You know, one was public health experts didn't understand how serious this disease was. And so a lot of their messages, particularly early in the epidemic are, you know, don't worry, uh, don't panic, um, you know, uh, you know, stay healthy, get lots of rest, get fresh air, it's going to be fine. You know, we're not, it's not going to be that bad. And I don't think that's censorship. I think that's, you know, that's just, that's, that's bad policy, you know, making predictions that things aren't going to be so bad when you really don't understand the disease and you don't know the consequences. And that does change, you know, and, and as the epidemic gets significantly worse in each city or at each local level, the public health officials do become much more um, urgent in their appeals and their recommendations to people and so on. Um, you know, and, and newspapers do cover this disease. Um, you know, they have front page stories about the number of cases in their area. Um, as we've seen, they cover, um, you know, in the case of mask regulations and ordinances, they report on them but they also criticized them. A lot of newspapers ran editorials saying, you know, the mask ordinance is a good thing and we should all follow it, or it's a bad thing. It's not, you know, it's not, we're not convinced by it. It's bad for the economy, we shouldn't do it. And so I think when we think, when we look at specifically the reporting on the, on the influence epidemic, um, there are a lot of other factors that are shaping that reporting that are probably more important than uh, censorship in the way we, we usually think about it. Okay, we've got time for may one, maybe two more questions. Uh, apologies to everyone in the chat. We've got so many questions in the queue. There's just no way we're going to get to all of them. Uh, this one might be more for Dr. Ludwig. 
so do masks basically affect the amount of oxygen you're able to take in or are they safe to wear in that regard? Um, so that is, and again, I'm, so what I will say is that um, referring back to sort of experts and people who have tested this. Um, so I went a lot through the public health literature um, and so one of the things that I thought was most interesting, um, and I'm going to then draw some parallels, so hold on with me. So the, one of the things is that in 1918, there was a very real sense that you needed fresh air, right? And that there were concerns about self-infection or infection from the mask itself. Um, and so I think that this concern about being able to get enough oxygen has sort of played out in both ways. Um, today, I know based on just my own reading of um, public health experts today is that it can minimally limit your oxygen intake, but typically is in no way um, harmful. Uh, so, so that certainly is one thing that I know it can be really uncomfortable as a person with asthma. Sometimes it is more frightening, it's more alarming. Um, so certainly it can change oxygen levels, but typically it's very, very minutely. Um, and I think one of the other things to really point to is just um, the, the sort of broader uh, picture of including masks with other interventions and the ways in which even in 1918 that had really profound um, effects, right? So not thinking it as, as a distinct sort of uh, thing that you can sort of focus on outside of the context of, of broader both public health measures and daily lives of people. Um, and so, yeah, I'm not, I'm hoping that answered the question. Yes, that was that was very helpful. Yeah, and I think that just in terms of Ariel's last point, and one I hope we can um, communicate clearly, one of the problems in 1918 was that masks sometimes seemed like a substitute for other public health measures. You know, if we all wore masks, then we could reopen the businesses and we could have you know people crowded together and so on. And of course, we know now that any you know requirements on masks need to be accompanied by these other measures. They do make some things more possible but they're not substitutes. And I think that's one of the things that we've seen when we looked at 1918 to say, yeah, that was, that was you know, an incorrect assumption then and we need to do things differently now. Okay, I think that's about all the time we have. Uh, I wanna thank our speakers for being here. Uh, this presentation will be up on YouTube later on, complete with all the links and everything. Uh, so you'll be able to see that on YouTube in just a little while when we get that posted. Uh, so again, we want to thank our speakers. Uh, we should definitely thank our uh, sponsors at Bon Secours for allowing us to put this presentation on. Uh, join us next week on July 29th at noon for Danger Brain, the Neuroscience of Fear, presented by Dr. Kathleen Franzen, uh, scientist in residence at the Science Museum of Virginia. You can register for that talk at smv.org. Uh, it's free to attend uh, and is open to the first 300 registrants. Once again, thank you for joining us today. Until next week, stay safe and stay curious.